Hello, welcome back. I hope you had a good break. Thank you for returning for this third part of this series, uh, the pre-conference workshop. Um, today we're going to, or now we're going to talk about scientific therapeutic exercise progression and how it relates to the case study that we've been discussing. Um, after our examination, we determined that the patient had SI joint region pain as a result of Main syndrome or thoracal lumbar junction referral. We talked about the manual approaches that could be used for that patient. And now we're going to talk about how we could help them progress using therapeutic exercise. And this, personally, I find the most crucial in terms of the rehabilitation process, because now is when we're gonna really start to affect cells in a more permanent way. And, and that's what we're doing, is we're trying to identify precisely what tissue is giving the patient the problem, and how to apply the appropriate mechanical energy to that tissue to make the change that is our goal to allow them to meet the functional goals that they have. So again, it comes back to a proper diagnosis and the skill in terms of being able to evaluate their movement patterns and taking them through a progression. Um, let me put some slides up here. And I did want to remind you that we have some textbooks. Um, they can be found at this website here. There's three volumes that uh, the clinical faculty worked on for almost a decade to summarize a lot of parts of our um, curriculum. The first is the, the science and theory with lots of histology and biomechanics, and neurology. And the second part is more the upper quarter. And the last is the lumbar spine. Um, there's great exercise examples as well as manual therapy examples in these, in these uh, volumes. So it's a great reference for you. This concept that we use to teach exercise is called STEP, Scientific Therapeutic Exercise Progression, and it's a evolution of concepts that came from Norwegian medical exercise and before that sort of using gymnastics for rehabilitation. Um, but the OGI and Ola himself have, have just added a huge amount of science to this approach and every year we sort of develop it and refine it a little bit more to just make it that much more optimal. And this is where I practice in Anchorage. That is this time of year. The, <clears throat> the leaves are not out yet in April, um, but the sun is getting high and shining bright. And this is a moose that visited our clinic um, one spring afternoon right in downtown Anchorage. So it's it's a little interesting, but we like them. Um, so in general, this is how we're gonna look at our exercise. We are gonna define the tissue and lesion as we've done. We're gonna figure out what the impairments are. This slide keeps advancing. Um, and, and deal with those impairments. Any other causative impairments, which could be posture, other regional dependency, um, biomechanical, things along those lines, we're gonna, we're gonna identify and deal with as well. And then finally, we're gonna define the functional requirements of the exercise. And those functional requirements are gonna help us dose the exercise appropriately. There's a lot of questions that can help you optimize your exercise program. And here's a list of just, just some in terms of the apparatus that you're using, the starting position, what type of contraction, concentric, eccentric, isometric, how fast the contraction is and where in the range of motion. All these things are gonna determine whether that, that exercise is gonna accomplish the goal that, that, you've, that you're using it for. And then there's a whole nother list of things, how many and how much, repetitions, resistance, sets, breaks, frequency, resting intervals. All these variables are gonna affect the 
benefits of the exercises that you're prescribing. And it's a very specific dosage that we're looking at in terms of our exercise to get the optimal outcome. The concept of the manual therapy lesion, which is um, sort of succinctly described by Ola Grimsby and had input certainly by Stanley Paris and others, um, is a description of what we typically see in the clinic. And this, this concept requires a lot of discussion and background and to go through in detail, but I just wanted to point out that if you look at some of these motor issues, kind of in, in the middle here, starting at number three with decreased muscle fiber recruitment, manipulation and your manual therapy approaches can help that but you're also going to be dealing with tonic fiber muscle atrophy in this in your patients. And, and that leads to decreased stability in their anti-gravity muscles, resulting in motion that is non-physiologic. Now that means that they're going to be moving in with little micro bits of instability. And so, and that's going to lead to more pain. So our, our exercise program, after we normalize things with our manual approach, is designed to sort of walk back through this lesion until we're healing collagen and healing damaged receptors, which create altered feedback so we can get normalized motor patterns. All right, that's, that's a mouthful and that's a lot to think about. Um, and that's why this particular component of this three-part lecture series is very challenging because it's a it's a it's a vast amount of variables that we're going to deal with in terms of optimizing our exercises. And what's the optimal stimulus for repair for these different tissues? Okay, our particular case study had a couple of these things, right? They had some pain with compression of the facet joint, implying there's some cartilage irritation. We don't know if it's actually degenerated. Um, and then there was some collagen tightness and discomfort with tension. And so what are the optimal stimulus to deal with these, these tissues? Okay, for cartilage, if you look at that column underneath it, OSR, optimal stimulus for repair, compression and decompression and gliding. And so that needs to be done with high repetitions in order to optimize the cartilage. Cartilage is dynamic tissue. It's not like rubber on a tire that wears out. And we have a lot of opportunity to change it by stimulating the cell that's listed there, the chondrocyte. So when we target specific cells, we get the outcome that we're looking for. And we can do that with manual techniques, but you're going to get a lot more with exercise just because of the sheer number of repetitions. In terms of collagen, how do we repair and make that more optimal? We put tension in the line of stress. So for this facet joint capsule, we need to put tension into it to make it more elastic. We're gonna stimulate the cell listed here, the fibroblast, which is gonna create a secretion of glycoaminoglycan that's gonna make it more lubricated and more elastic. It's also gonna create new collagen cells by putting tension into it. So again, manual techniques and exercise is how we do that. Um, we're targeting cells with our exercise program, and then we're targeting appropriate motor, motor patterns. This curve we lean on to help us with our dosage. It is um, referred to as the Holton curve because Advar Holton was one of the early descriptors of this concept. And basically what we're looking at is if you look at the top where it says 100%, of a repetition max, that's the amount of resistance that a patient could do one single time, right? So if you're looking at a press overhead exercise, if a person can do one single rep and then they're done, that's 100% of a repetition max. And as we move down this, this curve toward other functional qualities like strength, endurance, and endurance and coordination, which would be even lower, um, what we're looking at is if you look at, for example, the strength and endurance component, that is 
of a one repetition max. If you look on the left side where it says 75%, and you would expect with that level of resistance for a person to get some fatigue around 16 repetitions. And so if your goal is strength, truly strength, you need to have the resistance at that, at that level. If, if you have it lower, you're still gonna get good cellular uh, response, but, if, but you're not gonna get as much strength as if you have enough load on it, all right? And you're gonna get endurance at that load as well. If you want even more strength, you gotta bump it up to 90%. Now, 60% of one repetition max down on the lower left is an important number because that helps us bring optimal vascularity, blood flow, nutrition, oxygen to muscle tissue. Um, we recently had two of our instructors, Rick Kring and Jim Rivard, do a study at Cleveland Clinic where they used um, ultrasound to measure blood flow and evaluating different levels of repetition max, they found that in fact, 60% of one repetition max, which is between 24 and 32 repetitions with a little fatigue, <clears throat> optimally brings more blood flow to the tissue. And that's important because when we have pain and muscle guarding, that's a very useful way to decrease pain and muscle guarding. When they did the exercise with 80% or 40%, they did not get the same stimulus. With 80%, there was too much tension in the muscle, and so it actually occluded some of the blood flow. And with 40%, there wasn't enough demand of oxygen to bring in more vascularity. So this is a this curve is one that we use um, to help us guide our dosage. And I'll give some examples of that in our in our lab demonstration. Cells respond to specific stimuli. Remember that cartilage is dynamic. This slide I think is very valuable because it demonstrates that most medical people consider overloading of cartilage as the primary way that it degenerates, but underloading can also cause a problem. So if you have disturbed biomechanics in a spine or in a joint, an extremity joint, and it alters the loading of the cartilage in the areas where you're not loading it as much and the biomechanics are abnormal, you're gonna get degeneration of your cartilage. And so normalizing it with your techniques, your manual techniques and your exercise will help your cells stay healthier. Okay, now in terms of that Holton curve and the functional qualities that we discussed, obviously that may not apply to every single patient. I wanna take you back to the overlapping pathological models. There could be biomechanical issues, there could be biochemical issues, and maybe you wanna dose for that. And how would you dose for that? Okay, if you wanna remove inflammation, you're not interested in creating fatigue, you just want motion. You just want motion for the mechanical pump and the lubrication, right? So you, you don't want fatigue, you want super light resistance. What about psychological dosage? Where does that fall on the Holton curve? Kinesiophobia is a major player in our patients when they come to see us and you know what they look like. You ask them to perform a motion and there's a look of terror on their face, just like this, this famous painting by Edward Bunk, uh, Norwegian. This painting sort of represents the, the human condition and fear and anxiety. And you see it in your patients who, who have a fear of movement. They're anticipating something catastrophic happening with movement. You may ask them to flex forward and you know, they'll stop early and you'll ask them, did that hurt? And they might say yes, because they're getting altered feedback from their, their motor system when in fact there's, there's no stress. Or they might say, no, it didn't hurt. I just, I'm afraid to go any farther. And this is extremely powerful in physical therapy. I think this, this happened to me 
and at a young age, and it probably helped me decide to get into this field. My my mom was in a car accident. It wasn't terrible, but she did get a facial laceration. And I'll never forget this. I was probably 15 or 16 years old. And her face lacerations healed, but she sort of kept her face in, in kind of a wooden posture. Um, and I thought maybe she was you know, paralyzed in her face muscles or something. And, and I remember she went to physical therapy. It wasn't for her face, but because she had neck pain. And she told me that she just had the most amazing experience with the most amazing physical therapist. And I said, well, what happened? And she said, well, one of my major complaints to the physical therapist was that my face was stiff and I couldn't go like a horse. I couldn't flap my, my mouth because I was, because my face wouldn't do it. And the physical therapist just said to her, we'll just do it. And my mom did it. And it was like life changing, right? And this happens all the time. The power that we have working one-on-one -on -one with our patients is phenomenal. And sometimes the smallest thing like that can completely change a patient's life. And so kinesiophobia is is major, and I find a lot of times in, in my mind after my evaluation, I'm dosing for kinesiophobia just by giving them safe, easy exercises that could, don't cause stress or pain. So it may not be directly on the Holton curve, but it's certainly in the step concept part of what we're doing. All right, I wanna talk a little bit about progressions of hypomobilities because that's what we're gonna start with in terms of this case model. Because our patient, Kara, had some hypomobilities in her thoracolumbar junction. You remember she had decreased right side bending in the upper lumbar spine and decreased left rotation that we attributed to tightness in her joint capsule. So what are you gonna do for this? How are you gonna dose it? Well, first of all, you need a lot of repetitions to make a change with this, right? Doing a couple reps, isn't gonna do it. So you need, by definition, to be very low on your dosage, and the speed is gonna be low so that she can gradually go out and get that end range that she needs. Because there's a lot of resistance, there is, or I'm sorry, there's a lot of repetitions, the resistance is low. And where in the range is she gonna be moving? Outer range of motion, of course, because we're trying to gain some motion. So stage one, that's what we're gonna do. And the first exercises that we show today are gonna be dealing with this stage one right? In this stage one, these are the things we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to get increased endurance, circulation, exercise ability, and avoiding exertion. And I would say we're also trying to normalize biomechanics as much as we can. So let's go to the lab and look at those exercises. And then we'll come back and look at stage two, three, and four. Okay, I'm just going to breeze through these so I can show you the images that we're heading toward. And I'm just going to show in the slides first the three exercises we're going to demonstrate, and then you'll have them for your reference. The first is the side bending of the right thoracolumbar region, and we're going to use some counter curve locking from below. We're going to show three kinds of locking with these exercises. This is a counter curve or ligamentous locking. Next, we're going to use some artificial locking uh, using a wedge with rotation, and I'll describe it in detail as, as we set it up. And then finally, we're gonna do a seated rotation exercise um, with some spinal locking. Okay, so let's get back to our lab and stop sharing video. All right, welcome back. Okay, first exercise we're gonna do is over here, seated. And we're gonna use this bench here. And I'm gonna ask her to sit with her left ischial tuberosity on this side of the crack and her right tuberosity on that side of the crack. And what you can see is that creates left lumbar side bending, sort of as a preload. Okay, I think you can see that pretty well with this video. 
I'm going to have her put her trunk against this bolster. And then this weight I'm giving her is really just a token to give her sort of a visual and a tactile cue. Left hand up behind the head, and that just sort of lengthens this side of her body. And she's just going to reach down toward the floor. And the goal is to get right side bending right at the level of this bolster. And she's going to come back up just to neutral. OK, and I'm going to have her just continue those. So the resistance is light. She's not going to get fatigued here. Um, she's moving in the outer range of motion to get stretch on these capsules here on the left side. OK, she's going nice and slow that she can so she can get to the end of the range. If she's going fast, she won't be able to do that. And she's going to do a lot of repetitions. And what does that mean? How many? Basically, fatigue is not part of the situation here. So I might have her do 30, but not because she's tired, just because. She's she's going to probably get a little bored. Or she might get a little irritated just from her non contractile tissue. But we're going to do a lot of these and and ideally she would do something like this over the course of the day and home exercises are crucial. They're not part of really what I'm showing today, but I can't overemphasize them and every single patient. Thanks. Let's go here. Every single patient should leave your encounter first day with home exercises. All right, next setup, we're going to have you sit facing this way, feet on the step. And this will look a little bit familiar because we did this as a, as a manipulation technique um, in the last, in the last uh, little workshop demo. And so I'm going to set her up and get her moving, and then I'll describe what's happening here. All right, here's a little bit of resistance. Actually, let's let this slide just a bit. There you go. OK, and now I'm going to ask her to do left rotation eccentrically. OK, and then come back to neutral and then we'll talk about this. This is a little different than the. Than the image in your. In your handbook. Because in your image, it's a concentric left rotation. And all these mobilizing exercises I've set up to be eccentric because they're more effective. You get better elongation of the tissue um, if you set it up eccentrically. OK, she's her lower lumbar spine is flexed. And it's side bent to the right because of this wedge right here. OK, so she's side bent to the right in flexion which makes her right lumbar spine rotated to the right. And then eccentrically, she's moving into left rotation. So that's happening at her thoracolumbar junction. All right, so her lumbar spine is locked out from spinal locking. It's rotated the opposite direction. So this is just an example of using an exercise to localize the movement where we want it so we can get stretch in that joint capsule. OK, this is spinal locking. The last exercise was exercise was ligamentous locking. All right. Next thing we're going to do is do some artificial locking. So we're going to move over to this other table. This one's down. There you go. Just hold this for me. All right, let me bring the camera over. It's almost like we're in a real class walking around from here to there. Almost had a catastrophic fall, but we're OK. All right, so what I want you to appreciate here is that Kara is on this bench. Her left hip is flexed in order to create some lumbar flexion in the low lumbar area. OK, her right leg is extended, so it's just sort of out of the way. OK, so from there, 
what we're going to do is we're going to use a wedge and we're going to slide it in to the spinous process at about L1. Okay. <clears throat> Moving through the hip, we're going to create some left rotation. That's what she's lacking is left rotation. All right, slide a bit this way. All right, so now my instructions are let your knee come over this way and let your pelvis come up a bit until you feel pressure on the wedge. Okay, and then she comes back to neutral. All right, go ahead. Eccentrically, she's coming this way. These spinous, this transverse process is stopped. And so she's getting net left rotation at her hypomobile segments. It's very specific because it's artificially locked by this wedge. Again, we do a lot of repetitions. Fatigue is not part of what we're trying to get here. So it's isolated, segmental, facet joint, gapping with left rotation. Okay, we did left rotation and seated. We did right side bending and seated. Artificial locking is what we're doing here. One more rep for good measure. Fantastic. Okay, not much rest needed with this kind of dosage. When we're dosing for mobilization, there is very little fatigue, if any. So not much rest needed. We can bounce from one exercise to another rapidly. And again, that exercise could easily be done at home with some kind of artificial wedge um, or anything that could sort of block the spine from rotating. All right. Mobil those are mobilization exercises, stage one. Let's move on to the next part of the progression. So we just started down way at the bottom of this Holton curve, 40% of an RM, really no fatigue involved. There's always going to be some coordination happening with any any uh, contraction, um, but really we're just trying to address hypomobilities. Um, I think we need to go back to the uh, progression slides. Sorry, a little clumsy. All right, so we just talked about stage one. Now we're going to talk about stage two. Now we're going to just basically do more of the same. We want more motion, more speed because her, her coordination is getting better. It's still out at the end of the range, but really we're not worried about resistance at this point. We're just gaining more range of motion. Okay, still gaining more range of motion. There's going to be some endurance that's increased just from movement, and, and the faster coordination is going to help with that as well. Next stage we're going to think about is going to involve more muscle now. All right, so that's stage three. So at this point, she's gained some main range of motion, and now we need to start to stabilize and coordinate that new range of motion. So we're going to start adding some concentrics and isometrics and eccentrics in this stage. All right, the goal from a functional standpoint now is to start to get a little bit of strength in the gain range of motion. And this is where you're also gonna get some vascularity because frequently you're gonna start now 60% or 75 even. Um, you could do 60% in stage two as long as it's not in that, those outer ranges of motion. An example of that is, remember she had some muscle guarding in her longissimus. She had a trigger point there. So we could work that muscle or that muscle group at 60% of one RM 
to try to get vascularity in stage two. And at the same time, continue on that mobility progression uh, in, in stage two as well with a different dosage. I should mention in stage two, you're gonna remove the locking. And so at that point, she's gonna be using more just coordinative locking in terms of being able to control um, the motion on her own. This, the locking techniques that I described are really just a stage one um, concept. All right, so stage three, we are gonna start to address the muscle more. And when we get into stage three and start working with more functional movements, it's important that we have normal um, combination of work between our arthrokinematic and osteokinematic muscles. Every movement, or I should say every regional system in the body, whether it's the hip, the shoulder, the lumbar spine, the neck, it has, it has a combination of phasic and tonic muscles. Another way of describing a phasic muscle is an osteokinematic muscle because it causes osteokinematic motion. Tonic muscles are arthrokinematic because they control arthrokinematics. And here's a list of muscles in the lumbar spine that are arthrokinematic. Um, so we don't want to storm off into higher level exercise if we don't have appropriate timing and contraction of some of our deeper muscles. Um, and so I'll, I'm going to demonstrate just one way to look at the lumbar multifidus, which are, which are very important um, arthrokinematic muscle. Um, they've been described in detail um, in several different ways. And it's an honor to be speaking at a conference where Paul Hodges is also speaking. I've heard him speak um, at least three times in different parts of the United States, and he's always excellent. And um, he did, he was involved in this study looking at the lumbar multifidus and affirming the, the fact that it has fascicle specialization within it, which is really phenomenal. What that means is the lumbar multifidus has five different fascicles. And as you go from superficial to deep, here are the, the laminar fibers. This is a study from uh, McIntosh and Bogduck in 1986. Um, these deepest fibers, they actually aid in retraction of the facet joint capsule in the lumbar spine, which is basically about as arthrokinematic as you can get. It's controlling the joint capsule with extension and a little bit with rotation, and they have a different innervation. They have a greater amount of muscle spindles, and Dr. Hodges in his research looking at EMG in different levels of the lumbar multifidus found that those deep muscles, those laminar fibers, they're active regardless of what direction the spine is challenged. So even if there's an, a challenge to the anterior part of the trunk, those muscles are contracting. If somebody does shoulder abduction, those muscles are contracting. Where the more superficial muscles, they serve a more osteokinematic function and they resist extension and they help with orienting the spine. So it's just an example of the tonic system and how important it is in terms of controlling arthrokinematics. So there's a test that we use that is um, from Vladimir Yanda's work, um, and I'm just going to demonstrate one component of it, looking at the timing of the recruitment for the lumbar multifidus. Um, and in this prone leg raise position, what we're going to look for is the opposite lumbar multifidus firing prior to the ipsilateral side. And it's just, it's an easy one to palpate and it's a good way to determine whether or not somebody's got that neurological coordination dialed in. So I will demonstrate that. Um, and then I'll demonstrate a rotation exercise with a higher resistance. Uh, show some components of that exercise and then move to more functional exercises that ultimately lead to the patient's goal of returning to the basketball court, of course. And so let's start with this uh, multifidus 
recruitment examination all right so we are going to use this angle bench here i'm going to have kara come over and lay prone on it and i will demonstrate i'm going to move a little closer so i can show some palpation all right so just so you can appreciate what we're doing i'm going to kind of zoom in here a bit and i'll stand on the opposite side and if you find the psis and you go just medial to them that's approximately the level of l4 and there's very little fascial uh interruption there so you can you, it's a good place to palpate the lumbar multifidus and so if you just come in nice and snug on either side with your thumbs you can you can determine the activation pattern and so i'm going to ask kara just very slowly lift your left leg and come back down and you can see her leg raise and what i'm looking for is right when she initiates i should feel her right lumbar multifidus activate sooner than her left. Okay, and she had some symptoms right here. Remember, that's how this whole thing started. She said, I have pain right here. We identified some muscle guarding here, some dysfunction in the spine. And right now, when she elevates her left side, I feel this left multifidus kick in prior to the right. And so she's got a little bit of incoordination or inhibition of the right side and a little hyperactivity on the left. How can you deal with that? Well, you can use manual techniques to try to deal with it. Dr. Tom Olson will talk about activation using manipulation. But the other thing you can do is use an external cue to try to fix that. So for example, in this case, if I gave her a resistance of hip adduction, so don't let me pull your leg out, right? So I just activated her hip adductors and then asked her to extend, okay? And if I did this with a pulley, so now she's got a combination, right? I can recheck that and see if it normalizes. And frequently it does. And in fact, when she did that right there, it was better. Because when you resist adduction, you help recruit the pelvic floor and it can normalize activity. Okay, maybe I'll have her do just a simple drawing in maneuver where I teach her how to just kind of hollow her, her abdomen slightly, try it again, and see if it normalizes it. Okay, I prefer using some sort of external cue than an internal one, but there's a lot of different ways you can make this work. Sometimes unloading this leg so putting a pulley around it, and so you're taking maybe 20 pounds off of it, and then asking her to actively extend, sometimes that will normalize the coordination, okay? The point is, there's a lot of things you can do to normalize this, and you want to normalize this before you start doing bigger, more dynamic osteokinematic moves, which we're gonna move into now, okay? So that's the crossed extension test. That the normal pattern description would be if she did hip extension here, you would see glute firing opposite lumbar multifidus and then up into the erectors. And that's described in the one slide I gave you. Okay, great. You can come off of there. And we're going to set up another exercise here as you continue to get the tour of the entire clinic. All right, so we're doing a progression now, and I'm going to give you the kind of big view here so you can see what's happening. All right, so you go ahead and move while I talk through this. Okay, remember that one of her problems was hypomobility into left rotation. Okay, we 
did a lot of mobilization exercise, and now we're going to strengthen the, in, in, in the gained range of motion. So here she's doing straight left lumbar rotation, okay? And the dose or the resistance is at least 60%. If it's 60%, she's going to get nice vascularity. She's going to get fatigue at 24 to 32 reps. But if we're truly strengthening in this stage three, this needs to be more like 75% of one RM, and she's going to get fatigue doing it. Okay. If you want her to hit her end range a little sooner, you can stagger her legs, put her left foot forward more, right foot back, which sort of preloads her spine. So now that when she rotates to the left, she's going to hit that end range sooner and more solid if that's what your goal is that's just a staggered stance thing to sort of wind up her spine all right i have the angle of the pulley just to encourage straight rotation okay this is set up to facilitate a movement if we wanted to target a specific muscle like the lumbar multifidus or the obliques or something like that we have different options for pulley angles there's there's many many variables with this step progression and dosage to get specifically what you want okay so she's getting fatigue that's what we want i have it set up so that when she's a little bit in her lengthened range right there the pulley angle is 90 degrees from her level arm, lever arm that just makes it easier for her to work in a strengthening range there's a lot of a lot of little concepts that I'm throwing at you, I realize, and I hope someday you have the opportunity to take a step course and go through these things in detail. All right. Fantastic. Kara is killing it today. All right. We're going to do a functional chop now. So remember that the progression started with stage one, which was just mobilization, right? We used some locking techniques in stage one. In stage two, we took the locking away, relied on coordination, added more exercises. Stage three, we started to strengthen in the new range of motion. And now we're starting to move in a more functional way. If you move into the functional exercises too early and her timing of contraction and her arthrokinematics are, are uh, improper, she's not gonna get ultimately the function that she needs for her goals, okay? So this big rotational chop movement is gonna be dosed for strength. And we're gonna keep an eye on her lumbar spine and make sure that none of the abnormalities that we're trying to correct are happening at this phase, okay? So now to get a little more functional still, we're gonna use our speed pulley. All right. And so now we're gonna add some speed because basketball's got a lot of speed in it. So let's have you get a little more dynamic with your feet. Start here, and then you're gonna explode up. Boom. And just get ready and explode up, okay? So this is a very dynamic, powerful movement. We're using a, a pulley that won't jump, which is nice, it's a speed pulley. And now she's starting to really challenge her system in terms of coordinating in a new range with proper movement, okay? If we wanna change the work order and emphasize the eccentric part, I can coach her and have her start right here and then very rapidly come here and return and then pause at the top. Boom, boom, great. Boom, boom, great. Boom, boom. All right. So the point is, she has goals. She came to see you because she has functional goals. 
You have to pay attention to those and touch base with them at all times. That's how you keep her engaged and you keep her motivated. So we start with the very specific appropriate exercise, but we, we move toward what she's trying to accomplish. And so in the end, we're gonna grab a basketball and have her move through a functional movement, okay? So, and making sure she's got correct lumbo-pelvic coordination, right? And then let's have you go the same direction, but turn around and can you show us your spine? Because I wanna make sure that things have worked out here, right? She had limitations into, Actually, let's do the opposite way because you were limited with, there you go, left, left side bending and right rotation. So now we're looking at, no, I think we had it right. It was limited with, right side bending, left rotation. yes, exactly. So let's have you go down to the right and see if she's getting that side bending that we want and then up to this way, great. So down, good. So I'm looking now to see if she's coordinating what we want, okay? And I'm seeing some side bending, still a little flat to be honest with you, but we did all this in one hour. Normally it would take a few weeks, right? But she's hopefully, thank you very much. And I'd like to just give a hand to Kara for all her great work. <laughs> Um, hopefully we've normalized her mechanics and we've set up her tissue to be able to tolerate the goals that she's looking for. Um, that's what this exercise progression is all about. Starting with tissue specific, moving to motor control and ultimately functional return. It all starts with your examination and being very detailed in terms of your diagnosis and moving forward from there. The exercise system that we've developed over the years is something we're extremely proud of. It's detailed, it it's encompasses many, many aspects of exercise. Um, and I hope, I really hope someday we get to share it with you in, in Pakistan or, or wherever, wherever we see you. And it's, it's been an absolute pleasure and an honor to be able to present these concepts for you. It's just literally just a taste of, of what we can do. And remember that it's really all about trying to be the best practitioner you can be. That's what we're made of. That's what we're here for. And we're trying to treat our patients starting with care and ending with a cure. Basically, that's, that's the motto um, that Ola is is, is working with now, because uh, without the care, none of it works. And, and I really look forward to meeting you all and, uh, and, and doing this in person someday. I'm gonna share one more slide with you. Uh, let's see here. So like it says, thank you so much for your kind attention. It was an honor. I look forward to meeting you and enjoy the rest of your conference. It looks to be really spectacular. Thank you very much.